Hello, my name is Dougie Brimson. This week on the Stock Car Show, we'll be featuring two of the oldest Formula on the ovals. You'll see them not just racing here at the Northampton International Raceway, but all over Britain. Up here at the Northampton International Raceway Stadium, let's just run through one of those stats again, or a couple of them rather. V8 Chevrolet engines from America putting out over 600 horsepower. The average Formula One Grand Prix car these days puts out something in the order of 750 brake horsepower, and they run on circuits the two, three, three and a half miles long. These guys are running with very much the same sort of power on a quarter of a mile oval circuit. Just think about that for one second when you see them racing. OK, we get off the blocks, we get towards racing speed just to make sure that everybody can take the start. And these really are the heavy metal boys. There's the number one, the world champion, Frankie Wayman Jr. We just had a word with him. So the racing in New Zealand is heavy stuff, is it? Very gentlemanly here in the UK. 2.21, just uh, making a good barrel run down the bottom of the uh, line. Lots of action here at the Northampton International Raceway Stadium. Listen to those engines roar. Heavy metal indeed, full contact allowed. But to finish first, first you've got to finish. There's a lot of contact coming out of turn four there. There's some uh, weaving and bobbing going on. And 221 is over on his roof. That's a very bad accident. You don't see this sort of car going over on its roof very often. Let's have a look at it from a different angle. 221 comes out of turn four right over the top of the 83 car of Tony Williams from Buckley, and 221 is over on its roof before you can say it. Steve Cooper from Will & All is going to have one hell of a headache. Now look at the front of that car whilst it's on its roof. Can you see the uh, fluid dripping out of the front of it? That means there's going to be an awful lot of concrete dust have to be put down by the marshals. Out comes Steve Cooper. Protective brace still intact, that's a good sign, so St John Ambulance aren't going to be uh, doing an awful lot of activity to keep him on the straight and narrow, which is more than can be said for his car. The marshal's trying to turn it on its side again. Will it be back in the race? So we've got a crushed roof now, but what about the rest of it? Back onto four wheels. Oh, game over. Look at that buckled wheel. I don't think Steve Cooper's car is going to be taking any further part in this race. Now, as the marshal's put down the concrete dust, let's have a word with the driver. Right, we saw that happen. That looked pretty scary. What was that like? Well, uh... Still a bit shook up actually. I just remember going into that bottom bend. I just back end come out a bit. Just come out that um, that top bend then, and I just it just went then. Just went straight from me. But did it? Did you clip another car? I think I did. Yeah. I remember going up, coming back down. I I don't know whether another car hit me then from the inside. To um, I just remember seeing that fence. Was it over before you realised it? It went quite long, actually. I mean, I've rolled over it before, and it, in me, uh, in me mini, and it's quite quick. But that lasted quite, quite some time, actually. So, what sort of damage on first examining has it done to the car? Um, I noticed the petrol and the oil was dripping out, aerofoil, and. I, I didn't see anything else, really. We'll have a good look when we get back to the pits now. A somewhat stunned Steve Cooper there from Will & All goes back to the pits. He won't be taking any further part in this race, but there is a consolation that he might just get himself back into contention for. And we've still got a race to complete here on North Ants Motorsport. The Formula One stocks heat number one. Once more, we get under starters' orders. Once more, we fly around the circuit with the heavy metal boys. American Chevrolet engines, V8. Look at that concrete dust. You try hitting that at around 70 miles an hour and breathe at the same time. You'll find it's rather difficult. So, plenty of activity. 495 going through. You just saw him uh, burning off quite a lot of tyre smoke there. That was John Kayser from Saffron Walden in Essex. And the Phil Wheelton car in number six. Now, this is where a real dice is uh, unfolding. Number six, the yellow top car. 495 seems to be burning off tyres as he comes around turn four. He's done that a couple of times this afternoon. Frankie Wayman Jr. going through the field there, barreling through. Looks a very low-slung Formula One car that he's driving. He's not world champion for nothing. Just look at the guy's technique. Tight into the corners, wide on the exit, and gets the hammer down big time. Number one, looking for a win here in heat one for the Formula Ones. Real heavyweight stuff. A little bit of slidery going on down in the lower order of the field. In fact, that's big tank slapping going on for Neil Mellish from Worksop. That'll give him a wake-up call. Frankie Wayman's about to give 72 a wake-up call of his own. 72 just being deposed. James Yarrow from Market Harbour. Frankie Wayman goes wheel to wheel down into turn one. 
exits on the tight light, listen to those engines roar. Not a place to be if you're faint of heart. Frank Kiwainman going through, not many laps left, 495 going very, very sideways, burning off a lot of tyres there. And I think this is, yes, it's last lap time for Frankie Wayman. Takes the win in heat one. Business as normal now. Who's going to get second position? Is it going to be 72 or 6? 72. 72 loses a tyre almost on the line. And I think that's given second position to Phil Wilton. Now, in Formula One stock car racing, what you see out on track is only half the story. Because the guys that work here in the pits are what really carry this sport along. Now, I'm here with Nigel Parker, who's one of the members of the crew on the 250 Keith Chambers car. Nigel, how many hours a week do you put into looking after this car? Well, just lately, it's been every night. Yeah? It's around and a half, 11 at night. Have you? The last you, two weeks. Did you actually build this car? No, I didn't. It's a Clive Linson chassis, this is. Yeah? Now, what does your, you know, your missus think about you doing this? I don't think she minds, because she can get to watch what she wants on the telly when I'm in the garage, so yeah? it doesn't bother her. Now, if, when Keith comes off track and he's had a very hard race, um, how do you react to him? Do you just let him cool down a bit on his own or do you give him a bit of grief? Depends on the day and the occasion. If it's a big meeting, we wind him up, we get yeah. him wound up. Is he a good bloke to work with? Sometimes. Yeah? Now, how many other guys work on the car in total? There's around seven of us. Now, stock car racing is controlled by the start marshal, who is guided by the chief steward up in the control tower. Now, the stock car marshal runs his race through the use of flags and flag signals. Green is the most obvious one, that means go. A held yellow flag means caution, something's going on. By rights, when a held yellow is out, you shouldn't overtake, at least not at that spot. If you have waved yellow flags, that means all the drivers have to slow down and settle into single file with no overtaking. A green flag will restart the race. You have waved yellows because someone's stuck in a car or a car's broken down in a dangerous spot. If you see a red flag, then the race is immediately stopped and all the drivers should slow down to walk in place. The chequered flag is the one all race drivers want to see because it means they've just won the race. The only open wheeled non-contact formula currently racing in any significant number on the ovals are the Grand Prix midgets. Now as an engineer, these little cars have always fascinated me primarily because whilst the rules for building them are quite carefully defined, they actually leave quite a lot of scope for the home builder to put together something himself. For example, on any grid you'll have both front and rear wheel drive, some of them X Formula 4 chassis, some of them purchased from manufacturers like this one called Dastel. But when you stand next to one of these things, the immediate impression is that they are so tiny. The wheelbase is 82 inches, which is less than six feet but that makes them incredibly agile. And with fully adjustable suspension and slick tires, the speed they carry into a bend is absolutely incredible. The engines used in Grand Prix Midgets have to be under 1,350cc. This one's a Ford 1300, but you'll find anything from Volkswagen Beetles to Minis. But the thing about them is they're very highly tuned to give over 100 brake horsepower. And with these light little cars, that gives them an incredible power to rate ratio. Indeed, these little things are some of the fastest motors you'll see on the ovals. But the thing about these little cars is action. And so before we see anything else, let's have a look at them on the track. And now it's time for the Grand Prix Midgets. Heat one from then. Very, very different type of motorsport, as you can see here. Open wheel racing. Very, very small cars, high power to weight ratio as a result, open wheel. Going for the yellow flag, going for the green flag, you see we have a clutch start and away these little cars rocket, absolutely tearing round the course, the opposite direction to the stock rods that you just saw. Uh, an early shower there in the Grand Prix Midgets, 22 there is the car of John Hanna from Northampton. Good to see some different cars here. Oh, there's been trouble at the back of the field. Are we going to see a race stoppage? I don't think so, because they're deep into uh, turn two. Great shot from our uh, head-on camera there. As you can see, the cars come barreling down to turn three and four. Number two, Andy Collins from Bedford in one of the larger Grand Prix midget cars there. Open it in different fields. Those of you that have uh, watched motor racing for many years will perhaps recognise the silhouette. Oh, bad spin there, number 66. Won't be at all happy with that. Gary Piper from Staines as the rest of the field comes barrelling past him. Now, don't be uh, taken in by that air intake on Gary Bonner's car. That's not a cartoon car. That's a full-blooded racing car, the form of Grand Prix Midget Racing from Manningtree, Gary Bonner in 27. 
Uh, is that 18 or 19? Difficult to tell. It's actually Stuart Haynes from East Dereham, who's made quite a long journey to be here. We've seen him before. Look out for number 10, Rod Sale, started at the back of the field. There he is, cutting his way through the field and just coming up behind Gordon Pooley from March in the 33 car. I was talking earlier on about the sizes of cars. Different cars are allowed into this class, and if you are a long-term uh, motorsport watcher, you perhaps remember the days of the old Van Wall Formula One cars and the ERAs. These are cars built on very much the same sort of silhouette, but built in with huge roll cages to protect the drivers, uh, because as you can see, when these cars tangle wheels, all hell breaks loose. Now, talking of all hell breaking loose, there's a right old scrap going on there at the front of the field. 33 Gordon Pooley and Rob Sale in number 10. Now, that's not scrapping for the front of the field, that's scrapping for about third position. That's the state of the competitive racing that we have at the International Raceway Stadium. Number 27 going through there, Gary Bonner in the white and red car. Is he going to get the win? Checkered flags out. Yes, he does. Gets the win. This is Rookie Banger Racing, the very first time the Rookie Bangers have been in operation at the Northampton International Raceway Stadium. You're allowed to go round and round the circuit non-contact until the Union Jack goes out. You'll see Mr. Starter bringing the flag out later on in this race. Once that happens, it's a free-for-all and you can bang anything you like. There's Karen Tilson going through in uh, car 32. And there goes Darren Hart in something that sounds like it should be in the Jetsons rather than up here at the Northampton International Raceway Stadium. Into our first programme of Programme 2 for Apocalypse 1. Confused? Don't be. The racing is top quality. Plenty of tyre screaming going on, plenty of cars without too many dents so far. And let's just let them settle themselves down. There's a couple of old uh, Golf wag uh, Volkswagen Golfs in there. That's Karen Tilson in the 32 car. Very good, very regular, and she's incredibly regular now because she's being punted T-bone style across the start-finish line. She won't be at all pleased about that. But not too many dents and nudges so far. Where's the heart car? Answer? Nowhere to be seen. Now, out comes the chequered flag, which means, gentlemen and madam, you may thwack the living daylights out of your fellow drivers. Now, that's the way to do it. 2-1-1 takes an early bath. Let's have a look at it from another angle. Not sure whether he was clouded or lost it without uh, any... Oh, goodbye, Darren. I think Darren lasted about a, a lap and a half. So, um, well, they all have to start from somewhere. Lots of screaming going on from the uh, number 83 car there. That's Phil Quincy out in his first race in the Rookie Bangers. Look at the adhesion from that car. There isn't any. Looking also for uh, 407 Terry Bradshaw out in the uh, Rookie Bangers. 2-1-1 looks as though he's managed to get it all together again, not uh, throwing it against the wall anymore. Number 100, oh, taps out number 83. Phil Quincy picks it up very quickly. That's, that's a good recovery. There's Terry Bradshaw in the 407 car with a uh, slightly novel paint job. 32, Karen Tilson now uh, taking no prisoners. Good avoidance there, very good. Did well to avoid number 86. Uh, that's Chris Briggs just spinning there. 100 and 211 fighting for position on the infield, which is not quite the way to do it. 345, Budgie Johnson assaulting the barriers, but managing to uh, come off quite well out of here, actually. Well, he's pointing in the right direction at least, and that's a bonus this afternoon. Karen Tilson still going around in the Volkswagen Golf. The Sierras doing their own sort of pirouette a la Torville and Dean. And there's 407 with a blue smurf on the front. If you know why Terry Bradshaw has a blue smurf on the front of his car, please get in contact because we'd love to know. Budgie Johnson then in the slightly remodeled Sierra coming around once again. Remember, this is the first race for the rookie bangers. It's meant to be, oh dear, <clears throat> somewhat remodeled. It's meant to be the lowest form of cost motorsport you can get into. And it seems to be going rather well. Into the final lap then, this looks like it could be an inaugural win for Budgie Johnson, takes a checkered flag, gets first position in second position. Whoa, that's a good race. Terry Bradshaw in 4.07 gets second, Phil Quincy in third, and just edged out into fourth position, Karen Tilson in the number 32 car. More stock car racing right after this break. Welcome back to part two of the Stock Car Show. Coming up in this half, we'll be taking a look at one of the new formula that has sprung up in the ovals, one that's caused quite a stir, the Rebels. If I told you that a car using the engine from a Reliant three-wheeler could be quick and entertaining, you'd probably laugh. If I then told you that the same car had no suspension and was designed with contact in mind, 
You'd think I was mad, but you'd be wrong. Meet the rebels. Based on a very heavy duty steel chassis with a fiberglass body that's a 5 8 replica of a 1947 Ford Popular, the Rebels are powered by 850cc Reliant engines that have been reworked to give about 64 brake horsepower. Suspension, if you can call it that, is basic. It utilises rubber sandwich blocks and trailing links with no modifications allowed. In fact, Anyone caught cheating in the Rebels is immediately banned. That effectively rules out the checkbook racer. And the only thing you can do with these little cars is drive them. So let's have a look at some of them in action. And away we go into race one. Very big field of cars. But already they're getting big time sideways. Now these are the cars that you can come and hire yourself at the International Raceway Stadium. Cost you about 150 notes if you want to come and race for an afternoon. And believe me, you'll certainly find out where the men and the boys are when you race in Rebels. Car 36 getting out of shape. Whoa, there's an airborne triple Salka with a tow loop as well. Wimbledon based Richard Malam losing the liner from his front wheel. Let's just have another look at that. Gets completely airborne off the back of the red car. Loses the sidewall, the, si uh, the spare sidewall that they put on these cars. Takes out 217 in the process. Andy Kennedy from Breeston. But back in the race once more we go with these Rebels. Now that's not the way to do it. <laughs> no sooner do we get started than number 16. Pete Jenkins decides he's going to do a Harrier jump jet short takeoff and nearly ends up in the crowd as a result. There's a somewhat sad looking car there. Marshall's retrieving the bits and pieces under a full course yellow now waiting for the green flag to get once more up to race speed. I don't think we've uh, got much of the race under our belts yet. It's obviously a war of attrition. Who told these Reliant drivers that instead of racing Rebels, they were racing baggers? Car 43 up at the front there. That's Mark Tooby from Hatton. He's a well-experienced uh, Rebel driver. And number seven in second position, Greg Jenkins from Westfields there. Just losing position to 53, Graham Charlesworth from Brownhills. Takes the inside line. These are very grippy cars, actually. We haven't got much in the way of bodily fluids from bangers on the circuit. So there's not much sliding going on. 33 doing a fair amount of bouncing. He's going to be in the wall if he's not careful. That's Andy Milner from Tamworth. And he'll have lost a few places as a result. There's our race leader, Mark Tooby, coming through in car 43. And not many laps left in this first heat of the programme this afternoon. In fact, I think he may well be on to his final lap. If not now, then certainly in the next circuit or two. Quarter mile short course circuit here at the Northampton International Raceway Stadium being run in anti-clockwise order. There's a spinner there. Number seven coming through the throng there. And I think that car's been damaged. It's not moving very quickly at all. Let's have a look again and see whether we can find out what exactly happened. Have a spinner in the front of the field. 33 goes very, very wide indeed and clangs number seven. Oh, into the wall he goes. That'll have uh, deranged the front suspension. No problem whatsoever. So into the final closing moments of this particular heat one for the Racing Rebels. It's going to be the win for Mark Tooby, barring accidents. Doesn't often make them up here. There he goes through to take the win. Car 43, Mark Tooby gets the win. In second position, Graham Charlesworth in 53. And from Coventry, number 23, Mark Rogers. And that car, number 77, David Yap from Pelzal, trying to go in three directions at once. And still 33 and 16 trying to go sideways rather than forwards, which isn't really the way that you want to race a rebel. Still good entertainment for the crowd. As we've just seen, one of the great strengths of this formula is the fact that all the cars are so equal. What happens out on that track is down to the skill of the driver and the way he uses that front bumper. Because just because the speeds are slower, make no mistake, this is proper stock car racing. Personally, I had a few doubts about the Rebels at first. I mean, they do look a bit strange, don't they? But after watching them for a few years and speaking to loads of the drivers, there's no doubt about it, they are a cracking formula and I've got no doubt they'll be around for a long, long time. A large field of Rebels, over 20 cars taking the start for this Heat 2 of North Ants Motorsport. We'll show you the finals next week. But we just get up to racing speed now, waiting for the waved green flags to say, yes, boys, you may go. Very short wheelbase, quite twitchy cars, easy to uh, 
Clangham coming out of the corners and you'll see plenty of that going on, no doubt, in their second heat this afternoon. There you go, no sooner have I said it than it happens. Three into two definitely won't go and number three definitely out of contention. Darren Clark from Haverhill decides that's it, game over. I don't think he's actually completed a racing lap yet. 33, we saw him earlier on. Andy Milner and Bob Moss in uh, 82. Ah, oh, both sideways, almost as one, a synchronous pair and both out of the race. Now look at this, there's an enormous great mobile chicane building up as these cars swerve in avoidance. Let's see it again, 82 goes sideways, 33 goes sideways, 23 pushes 82 down the track and gets nerfed up the back end by 33 Andy Milner. Meanwhile, poor old number 30 gets caught up in the melee and just gets delayed. 8.27 gets away, Darrell Whitfield from Markfield. And still the racing continues, 82 waiting for a position so that he can insert himself back into the race. Or has his car actually stalled? I think that's the case. 56, oh, doing a Torville and Dean, not the place to do it coming out of turn four. Well, that's a resource, but I suppose you can reverse your way around the track if you want, but you aren't going to go as fast as going forwards. Oh, this is not banger racing, but you'd be forgiven for thinking that it was. Full contact allowed in the Rebels. The Rebel yell, I think, and the yelling is of the driver as he sees the entire field coming barreling down to him at full speed. Dave Morley from Belper in number eight just uh, disappearing there. 53. Graham Charlesworth from Brownhill, so we saw him at the front of the race last time, but that's not the way to do it, Graham Charlesworth. Now, what's it done to his steering? Is he able to continue at race speed? Looks like it. 56 going sideways, <laughs> sideways again and clouting somebody in the process. They really are built very solidly, these cars. I have driven one in the past, and I can assure you every single last bump gets transferred straight through the driver's body. A lot of these guys will be in hot showers or baths this evening trying to uh, rest tired and aching muscles. 58 in your picture, David Moores from Oxford. Relatively trouble-free, but that might well change as Mark Rogers and Coventry in the 23 car comes by. Just uh, looking to tap them out. 58, that's actually your race leader. And I think he's on his final lap. Yes, he is. We got confirmation. David Moores from Oxford. Holding the uh, the leading position, will he hold it? Yes, he does. Well, that's it for me this week. If you want to see any of the formula we feature here on the Stock Car Show, simple answer is get yourself down to your local stock car track.